Okay, we're on, so good afternoon everyone. We're going to start this session. If we looked at the number of sessions devoted this year to social responsibility within companies, I think we would be impressed and see there is a change. And the topics of the sessions in X reveal uh, progression in companies and uh, and an evolution of society as we try to understand it uh, at the economic rencontre. During the session, we're going to look into something which is somewhat special, the mission-driven companies. This is under the Pact Law, allowing a company to assert a raison d'etre. Typically, it can adopt uh, statutes, allowing it to be different from the traditional objectives of a company, like uh, maximizing profit and growth, and adopt other objectives, uh, the environmental, social, or well-being of their employees. Based with this new law, we could have several types of reactions. First one is to say, is it really any use? Is it really the purpose of a company or capitalism to look into this type of subject? We could also wonder, well, this is a marketing thing. We're just here to improve the image of a company, whether for customers or, or the staff. And you could also say, well, no, it's no good because, uh, in a way, companies have always contributed to common goods. But the le legislative change, it just reflects the changes in society. To talk about all that and talk about these issues, my pleasure to have an exceptional panel. Starting with Jean Dominique Senard, President of the Board of Directors at Renault Group. Then I have Alexandre Bompard, CEO of Carrefour Group. Clarice Kopp, General Manager of Alliance Group, Alliance Trade, you change your name. Chris Rocher, President of the Rocher Group, and Pascal Demurcher, CEO of Maïf. And we have someone in line, Mr. McKenna. I hope you, she understands it. Uh, Mr. McKenna, your former minister of Canada, and uh, now she has created an NGO to defend the environment. So, Jean Dominique Senna, I'll start with you. No one has uh, been able to avoid the fact that when the graduation is given in schools and prestigious university, Lord Polytechnic, HEC, a number of students. Those up against the jobs for which they had been prepared, and uh, they called upon a change, a bifurcation, saying that capitalism, the way it was, and uh, businesses, as they are, or as they, where they could have worked, were not capable of satisfying their expectations and their hopes. So, Jean Dominique, so now, are you hearing them? And if so, what do you want to answer? If I answered no to the question, I don't think it would be much more successful. We are in Aix-en-Provence, February 70, 1789. Mirabeau was uh, vociferating in the General Assembly uh, for the Etat General Provence, saying we are losing the right to convince what you do not want to hear. So from that point of view, he was right. And things are going, not going to change. Of course, we hear the students. How could we be deaf and blind? All the more so because what they are saying is very often full of goodwill. Of course, we hold the questions regarding inclusion and ecology, Solidarity is only one subject where we can actually discuss, which is uh, degrowth, and we'll get back to that. 
they're, what they have to say is very direct and something that they feel very deeply. But I would like to pass on three messages to them. The first is that capitalism is uh, evolving. Second, that's that you mustn't pick the wrong battle. Uh, to move, get out of something is not the right battle. And the third one, yes, we're talking about mission-driven companies, it's essential issues, but I think we can go a little further. The first message is capitalism is evolving. And frankly, I can tell you that the panorama for a number of years has considerably changed. Four years ago, when I was asking Nicole Nota on the question of the role of companies, we were not very comfortable. The topics that we mentioned were not fashionable. Look what's happened in four years. The world has changed from that point of view, whether in the US, in Europe, in France in particular, capitalism, or responsible capitalism, is uh, making way. It's suddenly moving. So don't, don't talk about all the rules, the soft laws that exist. It's no good, you know. But we are well ahead. Things have moved, particularly in France. Sincerely, the world has changed. Responsible capitalism is beginning to create its follow. It's um, with uh, capitalism for sustainability, giving companies a, a kind of political role in brackets, so that everyone knows that uh, companies play a central part in all stake amongst all stakeholders. It's understood that uh, not, not only are they there to make profit, but also deal with uh, the environmental and social issues in their activity. This is really very strong in minds and from a legislative point of view. And in practice, this has given rise to extraordinary experiments that my colleagues will speak even better than I could. Capitalism is changing, it's moving. And even because we are talking about it, so it is an event, and that is very good news. Second message is do not pick the wrong battle. It's not the subject to leave today. You cannot drop out. You cannot forget the initiatives which exist. When I think of what is happening in our companies, and sorry for talking about Renault because it's what, but it's what I know best, but when I see the incredible efforts that we are making to win the battle for the future, to project ourselves and uh, protect ourselves against the shortage of raw materials, to make an example of a circular economy in the automobile world. See what's happening in Florida at the moment. I could talk about it for hours, what's going on, batteries, cars, hydrogen. All these initiatives are there to remind us uh, that we can do really do something for the future. We say to these young people, it's not time to give up. Please don't desert. We need you here and now. This is when we will win the future, because frankly, there will be no gifts. I know thousands of Indian and Chinese students who are hungry, and they only have one idea, is to do what you don't want to do by dropping out. So I say, be careful. Your intentions may be good. The problem is that they won't last long, so please don't drop out now. When I was a student, I must admit, it wasn't, wasn't last week, but there were already dropouts, and it was long after May 1968. It was self-consumption on the Lhasa Plateau. Not everyone was very solid in terms of convictions, and generally it didn't uh, end up very well. So please, please, young people, hold on. It's not time, not time to let go. We need you. Every time you let go, the outer world, the rest of the world, will jump on the chance to create technologies and the future, allowing us to settle the problems that you are the first to talk about. Third message. It's, yes, we have created mission-driven companies, and those around me know it as well as I do. I'm very happy because this topic came up when we were with Nicole Nutter uh, three years ago, which uh, didn't exist in France, and now I think it's developing very nicely. See, it's happening. It gives a meaning. You, so what's the answer to you, the question of these young people? There's a lot of expectation we want to give us as a meaning. And the mission driven companies can give us this meaning. If responsible capitalism uh, it comes up in the future, it will, because there's a question of profit sharing. I hope we're not shocking anyone here, but we need to take an extra step. Otherwise, we will not be credible. Let me advertise for the 
Conseil Institute. We produced a document on participation and how to develop it. Must, must all be vectors to carry these ideas. Questions of profit sharing are now at the heart of our political and economic discussion. If responsible capitalism means something, we need to go further and deal with it reasonably intelligently. And my last thing I would say to these dropouts, do not forget you. everything that I said. If we don't do it in a European framework, we will lose the battle. It is uh, the, in the social heart of Europe, and European culture is the heart of all this. And I'll say with, basically with all the uh, blogs from North America or Asia, so if Europe cannot have its own social culture, it does not refer to the future of Rome to talk about uh, the social market. It's a strong culture shared by everyone. This is where things are happening. We need young people to do it because we might not be able to do it. Thank you for that. And I always say, come on, be strong because it's not time, it's not the right time to give up. My answer to you. Minutes. If you clap for another five minutes for each time, we'll never manage. Thank you for these words about the industry. Industry is definitely transforming. Alexandra. Alexandra is uh, trade moving as well. Yes, I'm welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here in Aix, up on the front here with my colleagues. And this would uh, really be a place for me to set it advertise uh, the transformation of uh, capital regarding CSR. We all share convictions. We have to report it about uh, the companies, uh, mission-driven companies, giving us tools to extend our CSR commitments. And this has been a tremendous progression. And uh, this is a platform here where I could uh, tell you everything we're doing in retail. But my condition, beyond the raison d'etre that we have adapted, beyond the CSR and the food transition we've seen and the commitments of management, so to come back to what I would say, it's a bit different. That for me, there are three major issues today. Today, are we having an incongruous debate today? We're in 22, 2022. To the war is at the doors of Europe, the succession of crises in all the domains, and uh, having a debate today as if we were in 2019. So is it a bit incongruous to talk about these questions today? And uh, here my question would be no, it's not incongruous. You know that the emergency situations are here, the young people want it, we have the, the climate, uh, climatic emergency, and the uh, company must make uh, commitments. Uh, in every cycle of activity, we have adopted our raison d'etre. When we were in the best, worst possible condition, we decided to make it about turn. And we have a provocation. Are we making these commitments because it's in our interest? Or because we are pushed by a, a kind of a late uh, Abbe Pierre a charity organization? Is it our responsibility, our interest, or are we making different commitments? And here I will give you my answer. I would be in a dream of waking up every morning telling myself I'm going to change the planet, that uh, I want a better world. But in the actually, it's not my job. My responsibility is to manage a company and create value. Create value for all of the stakeholders, shareholders, employees, all of the industrial world. That is my responsibility. That is my role. This is not my vocation to speak politically. I am there to create value. That is the role of a business. And so I don't get up in the morning to say, I must make a strong commitment because I've decided it. I make the, I do this because uh, I'm asked by my by the investors, by customers, by my personnel. So it's important not for the debate to be wrong, to be sincere in our commitments. The commitments we are making 
are commitments which come along with capitalism. And these commitments contribute very powerfully because we have a worldwide size, because we take the whole of the ecosystem along to transform things. And I'm doing it because it's my interest to make these commitments. I think the more we say it, the more sincere we are, the more we can avoid uh, being uh, told that we are greenwashing and not sincere. And the third major question from the debate of today is, in the end, are the standards, the statuses, uh, all these mission-driven companies and so on. Yes, this is what is generating the commitment. Well, at the risk of shocking those uh, the others on the platform, I consider that not at all. This is uh, the, uh, the the company which made me do it, which is. Uh, for instance, uh, my customers say I want well-being for animals. Uh, customers say that I want less food waste, uh, reduce uh, the plastic, and my staff say be better in terms of diversity, be better for in, in inclusion, be better in uh, g gender equality, on disability. I don't believe in a standard. I've seen, when I've gone, I've seen uh, other round tables say, should the state define the new role of businesses? Capitalism knows how to adapt. Capitalism is both the interest of each company, value creation, but also conciliating this with interests of uh, society. M Marx uh, said that uh, capitalism has a, an in an incredible uh, survival instinct. We are reconciling our own instincts with the wishes uh, of uh, the society, uh, in the society uh, environmental issues, and I believe strongly in that. Leverage for transformation is not a regulation, not extra standards, not an extra st st status. It is our personnel, our customers, our stakeholders, the industrial world that, that we work with who are encouraging us to change and evolve. When you look at it from this point of view, in the interests of a company, we have a great chance of being more credible and taking the, all the social issues along with us. Merci beaucoup. Um, Clarice. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Clarice Kopp, are you shocked by the observations made by the previous speaker that as a financial uh, company, do you contribute to the creation of value and do you think that you contribute to uh, the common good? Um, I do agree with what Alexandre said. Each uh, sector, each business has a mission and to fulfill the mission as best as possible. Most of the time, it's a matter of making profits, but profits are being used to invest, to commit, to innovate, to redeem your debts, to pay your taxes. And at the end of the day, you participate in the funding of public service. You are instrumental in financing uh, social bodies. So in a natural way, you contribute to the improvement of society. It has always been the case. Uh, companies had had uh, to embark upon a citizens' missions, but they didn't have to say it loud and clear. This is what shareholders want. The shareholders, these are not uh, 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 disembodied people. These are people who say th these people can uh, and, and trust their money to us so that uh, we can make the most of this money. The Alliance Group uh, uh, collects a lot of savings with insurance uh, uh, life products, and it's a natural movement. Uh, uh, customers uh, want us to invest in virtuous companies uh, with some women at the board, no children should work for these companies, but we don't need a state intervention. Uh, the private uh, uh, sector is rather efficient when it comes to managing these uh, transformations and changes. There is no wastage. A, a company uh, that uh, um, wastes too much, I mean, the, the company will close down. 
So uh, the uh, companies are instrumental in uh, changes and transformations. We are an insurer. We are an insurance company. And we have uh, to make sure that the suppliers will be paid by the customers. It's very simple. But uh, uh, we are present everywhere, and uh, we provide insurance uh, to people to the tune of uh, $100 billion. Uh, so we have uh, to develop trade. We have to develop economies. So we have to develop uh, wealth. It's a great mission. It's a great purpose. I'm very proud of that. And the same goes uh, for Alliance. The mission statement of uh, Alliance is uh, uh, to make the most of the money that is being entrusted to the company. So, uh, of course, uh, a company is not called upon to be an NGO. When a company does uh, to merge with lots of diversified objectives and goals, at the end of the day, you will lose out uh, in terms of your purpose. And basically, we will move away from our uh, purpose. So, I do agree. Uh, with uh, what Alexandre said. So uh, I want to again say what has been uh, said by the previous speaker. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Brice Rocher, you are in favor of this uh, uh, status, mission-driven uh, uh, company. This is a, 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 a purpose that uh, you've uh, uh, decided uh, to embed. And to what extent do you disagree with what has been said? Hello, everyone. Very happy to be with you. And I'm delighted to share my beliefs uh, regarding the topic. Uh, objectively, at the end of the day, a mission-driven company is a matter of leadership. It's a matter of personal belief nurtured by the manager. But uh, let us focus on the mission-driven companies and the status. It's a kind of guarantee to be protected against uh, ill winds. Basically, there are some constraints, but uh, with those constraints, you have uh, to uh, establish a mission-driven council and uh, the objectives uh, should uh, be in line with the status, with the purpose, and then you have a third party, an independent third party that will certify uh, your objectives. So you are policing yourself to a certain extent, and that's quite positive. Following the report that was uh, issued by Jean-Dominique and Nicole Nota. I produced a report uh, two years after the pact law. And I didn't have the benefit of hindsight, but I conducted more than 200 interviews. Of course, you are not obliged to be a mission-driven company in order to define a purpose and to make sure that uh, your company uh, wages a fight. So I am at the helm of a family company. So I wanted to have a supervisory board with uh, different people who are not in the company in order to deal with my uh, compensation payment, uh, valuable pay. It's just a guarantee. People won't uh, criticize me for my compensation payment. There are people outside the company who will pass judgment. And with the mission-driven council, that's the same approach. So what can I say about a mission-driven company? Very uh, honestly, uh, corporate culture has uh, a legal uh, tool. So what does it mean? So you can uh, develop corporate culture. All these stakeholders, all the employees are brought together. The employer's brand is being beefed up. When you define your purpose, it means that uh, your company will be waging a fight. You cannot wage different fights, but I think that it's very useful for your company to wage a fight. And what is a purpose for me? So for the uh, employees, the purpose has to do with the uh, pride of being within the company. So you can choose the company in which you're going to work, especially if you know the uh, fight that is being waged by the company. It's like a North Star 
a North Star. So the sense of belonging, the sense of pride is key. I think that the mission-driven company is a great tool in order to beef up corporate culture by implementing some uh, guarantees with some strings attached. And I do agree uh, with you. So uh, every year I come uh, here and I think that there's a positive trend. So uh, before it was storytelling, now it is story doing. So we need to turn words into deeds. And what is important is action. We have to be action oriented. If you consider the purpose, if the uh, purpose is hot wind uh, or is uh, hot air, the uh, mission uh, driven uh, purpose is uh, rock solid. Pascal Lemerger, Pascal Dumerger. So um, you think that the state has uh, to go further in order to make sure that uh, companies do the common good. So good afternoon to all of you. I've understood the difficulties. If we were to, to, to ask different uh, uh, people, we would uh, get a similar answer. Companies have a role to play in society. Uh, businesses and companies cannot be a, an object geared towards uh, its own objectives, growth, profitability. Growth and profitability are uh, essential in terms of uh, corporate sustainability. But we are witnessing an extraordinary moment in capitalism, in corporate life. Why is it extraordinary? Because at the end of the day, the uh, company is called upon to uh, play a social role, and I would even say a political role. And I can tell you that it's not a matter of knowing how the company is behaving. Uh, has the company created the relevant foundation in order uh, to fulfill the CSR objectives and goals? Not at all. What is the uh, political impact of the uh, company uh, through its uh, business activity? What is the role of a company for society in terms of uh, social and environmental dimensions? And if we consider that the company has a political responsibility, and I think that the survival of a company depends on its ability to shoulder this responsibility, I do concur with you. I don't know how to recruit a talent. I cannot retain talent if my employees have not a meaningful mission with the company. It's not a matter of of optimizing the annual results or handing out dividends to the shareholders. No company will be able to convince customers in the future if the brand is considered to be a brand with a negative impact on the environment, on a negative impact on societal and social issues. And uh, people do relate to those uh, issues and there are lots of examples in many sectors. I'm not going to mention names. The uh, stock market price collapsed to the tune of 75% for some companies. Why? Because uh, the uh, companies didn't behave uh, properly, didn't behave in a dignified fashion. So uh, dividends versus dignity, this is what is at stake. But of course, uh, we are companies and um, a company, in order to survive, uh, a company uh, should be profitable and uh, should grow. And many uh, companies, many businesses, they have a capitalistic structure whereby they have some shareholders. These shareholders, uh, whether it's legitimate or not, I mean, the uh, shareholders, they want to get dividends, and they want to get higher dividends, and uh, they pay attention to the stock market uh, price. And you have to consider their time frame. The time frame is very short. The main issue with capitalism, uh, it's its inability uh, to transcend a uh, short term. And I think that the state uh, can help us. There's a swing of the pendulum. So if you want to 
implement some changes, there should be new regulations regarding some specific topics. In 2022, given the uh, ecological urgency, is it acceptable to give uh, public subsidies without considering the uh, ecological impact of a company? So. Public subsidies should be based on the behavior of companies. So, for example, if you consider public orders in France, most of the time uh, they don't take into account social and environmental criteria. Let's say that you have a company that pollutes, that relocates. At the end of the day, the company will bring about some taxes. So I, I think that uh, the uh, level of taxes on companies should be different according to the behavior of companies. It's not a matter of putting some constraints. Of course, it's a matter of incentives. The uh, company should uh, move ahead, but I think that if a state uh, implements some incentives, uh, the, the company will be able to move ahead uh, far quicker, much quicker. So, Catherine McKenna, are you with us? Yes, from, yes, from Canada. I'm very pleased to take part. I wish I could be an ex, but I know it's very hot there. So um, it's good that I'm after Pascal. I look at things in a different way from a different way from others. I was a minister, and as a minister, I saw that there are a lot of promises coming from the company, and we see some action. We have some companies with us now who do a lot. But with climate change, it's not a very difficult challenge. The greenhouse gas emissions go either up or down. I think we need to see more transparency, more action, because what is the reality? We are seeing, seeing promises of, to act on action from a company, 702 companies. Uh, have a promise in the Forbes 2000, only half of them uh, the important promises, the, only half of them have a promise for immediate action, so we need a more extension, we need more action, but what is happening to the planet, we're all seeing it. We can see an acceleration of uh, climate change. We're seeing floods, we're seeing the heat, where uh, so people can no longer no live in some areas. We need to move faster. And for me, when I was a minister, I always said, it makes no difference for me why people are doing things regarding climate change such as the greenhouse gases must drop because by 2030 we need to divide these greenhouse gas emissions by 45 percent and now it's still increasing and uh, with uh, the war in uh, Ukraine in with Russia there are people who are getting an edge here there's no not so much uh, we're so using fossil energy to produce energy, so there are a lot of uh, voluntary commitments. I like to see that, and I think it is something that the young are asking for, customers are asking for it, and it is a major risk if you don't uh, work on uh, climate change, because the capitalistic system will have to adjust very quickly to the major changes we're going to see. So. If we see the temperature going up um, more than 1.5 degrees, we have a long way from where we ought to be, which is why the Secretary General, uh, the, the 16 experts of the whole world, 
coming from business, from environmental groups, from developed countries or developing countries to have a stricter and clearer standard. It's also a question of competitiveness. I know you have to look. I don't have a, a problem with companies making money. It's normal, but we know that some, so it's important for them to work on reducing greenhouse gases. Yes, there is greenwashing. There are fossil energy companies who they, they are working on reduction. That's why the regulation makes a big difference because it because it will be very clear how we can be sure that uh, companies do reduce their greenhouse gases as if they do the work themselves, not just buying credit uh, so that they can pollute. They must work in a better way. So, uh, but so, I've heard a net zero promises, but we had to work on an expert group, I'm sorry I didn't hear who because of the line, it's too bad. So, sorry. So, I'm here with the companies, I'm alongside them. I think. We can regulate, but it's also good to have a voluntary work on this. Unfortunately, we couldn't hear the end of the presentation perfectly, so I'm sorry to cut in, but thank you very much. Maybe a question? If you can bring a microphone. I agree with uh, both visions mentioned. I think they're complementary, particularly with your comment at the end, Mr. Rocher, when you say if the mission is honey, the mission which is more humanitarian is royal jelly. The question is, you said it's linked with the leadership of the manager. This is true, but who is going to define the mission? Is it the manager? Uh, the CEO doesn't stay for life, it changes depending on the companies, general manager the same, should it be the board of directors, uh, the, the staff, uh, the, when a manager comes along to find the mission, he's been recruited according to the mission that he wants to carry. That's my question for the five of you. Who do you think should define the mission? Well, who defines the social objectives? Uh, the manager, the company? The, the world in a way, and how do we really deal with the externalities coming from capitalism? So, Dominique, do you want to see the others can answer? The answer for me is clear, especially not the managers. It is basic work which should be inspired by the managers, but done by the teams, whatever their level of responsibility in the company. At Michelin, it took us three years, maybe say it's a bit of a long time, to get to a sentence which summarizes the reason being a mission must offer everyone a better way to go ahead. It took a long time maybe to get there, but behind these three years, there were debates that you can't even imagine what the debates were. In China, where people were working after hours to work on the subject. To give you an example, it created a kind of atmosphere in the company, an incredible commitment even before the raison d'être was born. I could say the same for Renault, who finally have a raison d'être. So I took uh, now an, a year and a half, I didn't want us to move too fast. It's a tremendous work, you've got the roots of the company, you've got this uh, the northern star, as you said, and uh, not the, the manager or CEO. At the end, will someone say, that's it, and I know who said, that's it, in two cases I mentioned, but the other work was done by others. Alexandra. 
I think it's a multiple answer depending on the company. If it's a startup, generally it will be the entrepreneur who will have it in him. Whether I agree with what is said, it has to be something which is collective because, once again, to develop culture internally for me, for the collaborators in the company. If I take the example of the Rocher Group, of course, we worked, it took us a year with different people from the company. It really was something which was very collective, but we started from the roots of the company, the entrepreneur. So it was my grandfather who created the, co the company, and the mission of Rocher Group is to reconnect men and women to nature in the metaverse world, which is quite useful. So this results from the personal experience uh, that uh, my grandfather experienced when he was 14. He always had fairly serious health issues, such as parents uh, had to homeschool him. He couldn't go to school. And so there was a very strong link between him and his father. But his father died when he was in 14, 1944, a small village uh, in uh, Brittany at uh, La Gassi. And he, refuge, he went to the forest, or he spent his days in the forest, and this brought him a sort of a comfort, consolation. And he became aware at the time that nature could have a positive impact on our well-being. And in return, he wanted to act for the nature. What I, seems important to me is that to determine a raison d'etre, we need to do it collectively, of course. But you have to start first from the roots, the values, the DNA of the entrepreneur or the company. Secondly, it should answer a future uh, challenge and uh, challenge today. So we must say that today we tend to have uh, chased nature from our life. It should also be based on values which don't change over time, although our business models change constantly. The values should not change. And for a small style exercise, once you have prepared your raison d'etre, I would encourage you to draft it on, uh, the, on the, the paper belonging to your main competitor, if they could uh, take it on board, uh, well, you have to start again. So the idea is still keep economic performance. You don't want to drive the company into the ground. That would want to make it sustainable to get profit. I've spoken to 200 actors. Very often there's a risk of a legal risk or risk of image, which is a real one. But my strong conviction is that a company can fly only if it has uh, customers, but it exists only if it's made of men and women, talents, even more so, and have the values as a reason for being. Some examples, we look at Aigle, Tia Partners, Danone, Ecopadis, Maib, the Rocher Group, and so on. We have all kinds of got uh, SMEs, um, only one unicorn, only one CAC 40 company. If Turkey feels good, these companies are still there. Let's go to the same question. Who decides? Uh, it is up to the companies to decide what is right. Clearly, there's a distribution between the state and uh, the company. The state needs to define a target in a way, and uh, the companies will define the road to get there. Everything that's been said about the way inside a company you can define your mission, I can only uh, agree with it. You know, there was also there was a question of uh, perennity. Depending on if it's a CEO defines uh, it, if it's a the board, what happens when the CEO leaves? It's one of the interests, I think, of the status as a mission-driven company, because there's transparency, because the actual statutes, uh, constitution of the company has changed. 
the fact that you make public that you have become a mission trip company, you're also publishing uh, the external auditor's report who come and check uh, that you have met the objectives uh, defined, means that you're creating something which is irreversible. My, if you were saying, have become mission-driven companies. I can't imagine my in a few years explaining that we will no longer be a mission-driven company. So it's necessarily something sustainable in the choose the status. This is a clever scoff. The word that is for me, it's not. It's the customers. I think uh, the no company without customers. That is where the mission should come from. Alexandre, do you agree with that? A couple of words, because I'm holding and not waiting for the state to define my mission, my responsibility. I consider it is the role of the board of directors, the managers, the personnel. And I'm in a, let's see, I've seen 20 laws over the last 20 years. I'm a bit wary of new normatives, new laws. Secondly, I think we must be careful not to lead it to believe this is an ethical difference between companies, not bad or good companies. There's not a good company which is mission-driven and the other one which is a listed company. When the question came up about staying in Russia, there were state companies, mission-driven, listed companies. They all answered according to a number of concerns, to public opinion, customers, staff, and everyone made a decision according to all this, not because of their status, not because of their mission or anything. I think you have to be careful with this idea. There will be ethical companies and others are non-ethical. I think you have to be careful about that. Well, thank you. I just want to thank you for this great session. We didn't have enough time. Thank you all. Thank you to the panelists. And thank you all for your questions and your attention. Thank you.